Chapter 2. Clarencio. Suicide. Suicide. Criminal. Wretch. Insults like these surrounded me in every direction. But where were those cruel-hearted malefactors? I sometimes caught glimpses of them as they glided through the thick darkness. And when my desperation reached the breaking point, I would attack them with all my strength. However, I futilely beat at the air in those paroxysms of rage. Sarcastic laughter would then sting my ears as the shadowy specters vanished into the darkness. Who could help me? I was tortured by hunger and parched with thirst. The most ordinary incidents of physical existence were laid bare before me. My beard had grown and my clothes were beginning to tear due to my efforts at survival in that unknown region. However, the most painful circumstance wasn't the terrible abandonment in which I found myself, but the incessant attacks of perverse forces that vexed me on the solitary and dark paths. Those forces angered me and kept me from coordinating my ideas. I desired to reflect maturely on the situation, to frame its causes and establish new trains of thought. But those voices, those laments mixed with such blatant accusations, bewildered me irremediably. What are you looking for, wretch? Where do you think you're going, you suicide? Such ceaseless repeated accusations rent my soul. I was a wretch, but a suicide? Never. Such a charge wasn't logical. I thought I had left my body against my will. I remembered my desperate duel with death. I could still hear that last medical diagnosis announced at the hospital. I remembered the efficient assistance and the painful dressing during those long days that followed my grave intestinal operation. During such reminiscing, I could actually feel the thermometer, the unpleasant prick of the needle, and finally the last scene that preceded the big sleep. My still young wife and my three children staring at me in dread at the prospect of eternal separation. Afterwards, my awakening in this dark and dank landscape and the great trek that seemed endless. Why was I being accused of suicide when I had been coerced into giving up my home, my family, and my loved one's sweet company? The strongest man will come to the end of his emotional endurance. Though I had tried to be firm and resolute at the beginning, I began to sink into long periods of despondency. And instead of building up my morale, I felt like my suffering would never end. And long repressed tears visited more frequently poured out of my heart. To whom could I run, no matter how great the intellectual education I had brought from the world? It could do nothing now to alter the reality of my life. Before the infinite, my knowledge was like tiny soap bubbles blown about by the impetuous winds that transform landscapes. I was something carried by the typhoon of truth to faraway places. However, the situation hadn't changed another reality of my essential being. Asking myself if I hadn't gone crazy, I found that my awareness was highly alert. And that fact made it clear to me that I was still myself, that I still possessed the sentiment and learning acquired during my material experience. My physiological needs remained unchanged. Hunger preyed on my every fiber. But my ever-increasing weakness made me feel utterly exhausted. From time to time, I came across some seemingly wild vegetables growing along humble trickles of water, into which I thirstily threw myself. I devoured the unknown leaves and glued my lips to the dark spring as long as the irresistible forces would allow me before driving me on. I often tasted the mud on the road, cheerfully recalling the daily bread of before. I frequently had to hide from enormous herds of animal-esque beings that trampled past me like bands of insatiable beasts. Those were blood-curdling sights, which only increased my despair. 
It finally dawned on me that there must be an author of life wherever he might be. This idea comforted me. I had detested all the religions of the world, but was now feeling the need for mystic comfort. A doctor extremely caught up in the nihilism of my generation, I was in need of a renewed attitude. It was vital that I confess the failure of my self-centeredness to which I had proudly devoted myself. Finally, I was totally out of energy, and I felt myself completely prostrate in the mire of the earth without enough strength to get up. It was during that bitter crisis that I implored the supreme author of nature to reach out to me with his paternal hands. How long did my plea last? How many hours did I spend praying with hands folded like an afflicted child? I only knew that a rain of tears washed down my face and that all my feelings focused on a pain-wrought prayer had I been totally forgotten. Wasn't I, too, a child of God, even though I had never thought of knowing his sublime activities while engulfed in the vanities of the human experience? Why wouldn't the Eternal Father forgive me? when he provided nests to help birds and lovingly watched over the delicate flower in the wild field. Ah, one must have suffered a great deal in order to understand all the mysterious beauties of prayer. It is necessary to have known remorse, humiliation, and extreme misfortune to effectively drink the sublime elixir of hope. It was at that moment that the dense mist cleared away and someone came forward, an envoy from heaven. A kindly old man smiled paternally at me. Then he bent down and gazed intently into my face with his big, lucid eyes and said, Courage, my son. The Lord has not forsaken you. Bitter tears seemed to bathe my entire soul. I was deeply moved and tried to express my joy to the remark about the consolation he had brought to me. Yet, gathering all my remaining strength, I could only ask, Who are you, kind envoy of God? The unexpected benefactor smiled kindly and replied, My name is Clarencio, and I'm nothing more than your brother. And noticing my exhaustion, he added, Remain calm and quiet for now. You must rest to regain your strength. Then he called to two companions, who seemed to be devoted servants, and ordered, Let's give our friends some first aid. A white sheet was spread on the ground, like a stretcher, and the assistants readied to carry me away on it. As they carefully lifted me, Clarencio thought for a moment and then explained, like someone who had just recalled a pressing obligation, Let's go. I need to get back to Nosolar as soon as possible. 